Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. It's pretty late right now. It's about um, close to midnight for me. I attended a Green Drinks uh, Ottawa meeting earlier. I, w I went easy on the beer because I knew I would want to do some videos tonight. But um, I found out that th this Green Drinks organization, they have 24 locations in Ontario alone. And there's apparently hundreds of them across uh, North America and other places. There's probably even one um, in your location. If there's not, you can start one up. So basically what it is, is you just find a room in a restaurant or something and you go there, you set up some deal with the, um, with the owner. You know, you rent this, you, in this room, they'll, uh, you know, you encourage people to, you know, have their dinner, buy some drinks and stuff. Uh, and, you know, that's normally a, an exceedance of what it would be on a normal night. And then every, they're happy and you get people, uh, you know, a critical mass of people. It's people from all different backgrounds. All, they all have a common uh, concern for the environment, for climate change, for where things are heading. So to just tonight I was talking to a couple of guys that are starting uh, doing a startup on taking plastics, mixing sand in with it, and then having ceramics, making ceramic materials. Talked to uh, a number of people in the solar, um, you know, that install solar power. I talked to a uh, very interesting person who's talking about ways that waste heat from industrial processes or power plants or whatever can be actually used um, in combined heat and power to, you know, why waste that heat? Why pull water out of a river, heat it in your processes and put it back in the river? Um, just use that, put that hot water to buildings and it'll heat the buildings in the winter, etc. So really interesting. Um, that's my plug for them. You know, you may think that uh, weather, that climate is mostly in the atmosphere and a lot of it is in the atmosphere we talk about weather systems and so on but when i talk about the climate system of the earth um there's many of uh, many components there's not just the atmosphere with the greenhouse gases there's also the hydrosphere the oceans there's the cryosphere which is the sea ice and the ice sheets there's the lithosphere, which is the earth and the soils and uh, rocks and things. And then there's the biosphere, which is all the plants and animals, including humans. You know, we can say the anthroposphere, you know, which is all the humans on this uh, surface of the earth. And each of these different sections or regions is interconnected with all of the others. So just to give you an example, in the oceans, we have inter interactions with the um, ice. Um, there's heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. There's wind stresses, which cause waves and cause mixing of the ocean, vertical mixing, horizontal ocean currents. There is precipitation, heat comes in, the sun's driving all of this whole system. You know, it's, for example, heating up the surface of the oceans, making them more stratified, so there's less vertical exchange, there's more evaporation of water. That, that water vapor carries latent heat up into the atmosphere. Um, as, as it cools down, as it rises, the, the latent heat is released, fueling storms, and, uh, you know, as it generates the clouds, there's changes in the levels, there's all of the biochemistry and the ocean life and stuff. And you can look at each of these individual areas and look at all these interactions and just try to think about how these things are all connected. So as you're causing warming here, how does it impact all of the other things? So we talk about the climate system of the earth. So let's join the dots about the global climate system. Okay, this is not done enough. We, we're, we're a specialized world. We're a, we've got specialized programs in, in, in universities. Um, we, you know, we're basically a world of specialists because, you know, and the generalists, the people that look at the big system tend to lose out, right? They're like, uh, you know, like the jack of all trades, for example, as opposed to the specialists. And the specialists always make the, the, the big bucks, right? The, um, and they just know more than anybody else about their specific area. And that's, you know, we've developed that way um, we basically developed that way through uh, 
uh, the evolution of, of history, um, the ev evolutions of human on the planet. As we get more and more specialization, we could then, um, you know, develop and get more advanced because there you because not everybody would have to worry about every particular skill, right? So, but it's it's gone too far. Um, there's and we need more holistic overall views of of the planet. So this is what I try to do: join the dot. So we've increased the human fossil fuel combustion. We've changed the land characteristics. So the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, are quickly rising at ever increasing rates. So very non-linear, ever increasing exponential rates up. So this is warming the earth. This is basic spectroscopy, chemistry, physics, you know, if it's not warming the earth with more greenhouse gases, it violates every, every branch of science. This is causing obviously warmer thing. It's warmer. So it's melting the Arctic sea ice and snow cover. Therefore, they're much darker. The Arctic is darkening rapidly. We're getting faster Greenland ice sheet melting. That's ice that's above sea, above, that's ice that's sitting on bedrock. It's going, it's melting. The water is running off of the land, going into the oceans, rapidly raising sea levels. The surfaces are becoming darker. So the surfaces of the, because we lose sea ice, there's dark ocean below. We lose snow cover on the land. It's permafrost below. The surfaces are getting darker. In fact, the Ceres satellite indicates a drop from a reflectivity of 54% so light comes in, 54% was coming up, and now only 48% is coming up. And this is a big difference, that extra energy that is, is now being absorbed in that region, and it's melting the snow and ice faster and faster. More sunlight's being absorbed, the north is warming faster by five times to eight times the global average. Okay, forget about that two times, or, you know, it's always been two times, and then that was the claim the arctic's warming twice as fast that's just not right and then it's and lately now it's become two to three times or three times you know it depends on what you define as the arctic what latitude region you define there's different definitions but you know areas large vast areas of the north are warming by eight times the global average and in fact we've seen it's not uncommon to have temperatures 20 degrees celsius warmer than normal in the arctic for extended periods of time you know, that's way faster than even these numbers. So what does this do? Well, it lowers the equator to Arctic temperature difference, right? Arctic warming really fast, equator not changing temperature that so much. So you get less heat. Therefore, you know, heat goes from hot to cold. The larger, the hotter the hot, the colder the cold, the more heat's gonna go from hot to cold. Okay, if you make the cold less cold in the Arctic, then there's going to be less heat going there. The, the temperature difference is less. Okay, this has huge implications. Okay, what it means in the atmosphere is the jet streams slow down. The jet streams are created by air moving north from the equator, and then it deflects to the right because of the rotation of the Earth, and it gets less volume, so it gets compressed into these jet streams which circle the planet. These jet streams are slowing down, and they're becoming wavier in the north-south direction. And they're often getting stuck. And they're going as far north as the North Pole. And they're going as far south as the equator, where they then cross the equator and join jet streams in the southern hemisphere. So these changes in the jet streams are creating, from the ridges and troughs, they're creating lows and highs. And the lows are, are and that's creating extreme weather events. So we're getting the torrential rains leading to floods in the low pressure areas of the troughs, and we're getting heat waves in the ridges of the jet streams. And these, the jet streams getting locked in position, so these events are getting more frequent, they're stronger, okay, because there's all this energy released from the evaporation of water carrying the heat up. It condenses, it. there's more water vapor in the atmosphere in warmer air, okay? For every degree Celsius rise in temperature, there's 7% more water vapor. So 
the there's a lot more energy up in the atmosphere so these storms are stronger they last longer they don't move as quickly across the surface they're larger in area so they linger over certain areas torrential rains and they're also occurring in new locations okay uh, for example you know we get a foot of snow in the Atacama desert where you know it hardly rain it rain, might rain once a decade the oceans the currents such as the Gulf Stream are slowing down contributing to for example they contributed to large sea level rise on the east coast of North America 2010-2011 um, about a th third of the heat transfer is in the oceans about two-thirds is in the atmosphere that's kind of the, the breakdown distribution okay now there's lots of good tools or diagnostics to allow you to become an armchair climatologist okay don't just listen to what i say this is a hands-on thing you know you do you learn much better by doing rather than listening some people learn better by listening and other people by reading um i'll post this presentation soon so climate reanalyzer just google it um, go to the site play around with the features for example this is the daily average you know from may 19th and it shows the how you know how the antarctic is very warm we've got a warm patch here this is anomaly which is departure from average so it's based on a baseline, 30, 20 year baseline. Um, you know, whatever the average temperature is, you know, over those 20 years at a given point on the planet and what it did on May 19th relative to that average. So we've got cold area here, warm area and so on. So this is a very good way to see what's happening. Um, and here's another image of, you know, sea surface temperature. So you can see the sort of structure. You can see the warm Gulf Stream. You can see a warm current here. Um, there's no El Nino going on because the heat would be piled up over here. Um, so you can, you can do, you know, don't just take my word for it. Just go to these sites. Go, go to this site and look at this stuff yourself. This is another excellent site, Earth Null School. So you bring up this site. You Google Earth Null, School, Earth Null School, you get this globe here, you click on Earth and it brings up a whole bunch of menus and then you play in this particular, if you want to look at the jet streams, you have to go to, you have to look in the course in the atmosphere, you have to select a pressure of 250 millibar, which is it's about a thousand at the surface, it's 250 up about where the jet streams are. And then you see these streaks here, you can see the whirls and patterns of the jet stream. Another excellent site is Arctic sea ice graphs. So just Google Arctic sea ice graph, you know, and you can see images of what the sea ice looks like in terms of concentrations. These are three different concentration maps. You can see plots to see how it compares to averages, longer term averages, and the, de the variation and deviation and previous minimum years and so on. So really have a look at some of this stuff. Now, what do we, in order to understand the present and try to make projections on the future, we need to talk about the past a little bit because, you know, we can learn a lot from the past. So we have these time machines if you like these ice cores in antarctica it goes back 800,000 years so we drill a core down to the bedrock and we bring up the ice and we measure we can measure the methane and co2 concentrations in the ice from the bubbles that are trapped we can analyze the bubbles at different levels we count back down the levels we know the time there was a volcano that went off we can see a dark layer in the core oxygen we the when the water is when the ice is melted, we get the we measure the oxygen isotopes in the frozen water that gives, tells us the temperature when the ice was formed. And so we get information going back 800,000 years from these Antarctic ice core time machines. And this is showing what these greenhouse gases are doing um, right now. 
And what I'll do is I'll finish up here. So remember, we need to talk about the climate system and we need to join the dots and connect the different parts of the climate system to understand what is happening. Thank you.